and welcome to ISA's web seminar, ISA 100 Principles of Operation Overview. The seminar materials include a downloadable presentation, a question and answer session, a, and a seminar survey. You earn one PDH for attending. Today's seminar is 60 minutes in length. There will be three 10-minute question and answer sessions. As a participant, you are in a listen-only mode. You may ask questions via the internet using your keyboard at any time during the presentation. However, the presenter may decide to wait to answer your question until the next Q&A session. If you have audio difficulties, press star zero. Questions may be asked via your telephone line. Press the star, then the number one, on your telephone keypad to ask a question. If there are no other callers on the line, the operator will announce your name and affiliation to the audience and then ask for your question. If other participants are asking questions, you will be placed into a queue until you're for, you are first in line. While, the queue, <clears throat> while in the queue, you will be, listen, you will be in a listen-only mode until the operator indicates that your phone has been activated. The operator will announce your name and affiliation and then ask for your question. At this time, I would like to give a brief introduction of our speaker. Wayne Mangus currently co-chairs the ISA 100 Standards Committee for Industrial Wireless Automation and directs a center known as the Extreme Measurement Communications Center, EMC Squared, as ORNL dedicated to facilitating deployment of assured communications channels, especially wireless in harsh environments. He also directs the U.S. Department of Energy's Industrial Wireless Program at Oak Ridge National Lab, with a focus on the needs of the hard industries identified by the U.S. Department of Energy's Industrial Technology Program. Wayne has worked extensively with steel and paper com companies to bring robust wireless technology to their marketplace. In 1996, Wireless for the Corporate User declared Wayne a visionary for his views on wireless applications in this field. He has published and presented papers around the world on the topic and continues as a contributing editor for Sensors Magazine. His latest interest is in modeling and simulation of communications networks for robust, secure connectivity in industrial environments. Wayne has also published his published in areas from acoustic signal processing to security and reliability issues associated with wireless sensor networks. We will now begin today's seminar. Mr. Wayne Mangus, you may be, you may now begin. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, it's good to be here. Glad to see. Let's see, we're up to 33 now on our sign-up sheet. Uh, as uh, Bradley said, I'm the co-chair. We, we have Pipes, Pat Schweitzer now from Exxon as the other co-chair. I'm glad to have him on board. Uh, and as, as the thing said, I was I have been the DOS, DOE Industrial Wireless Lead. Uh, what we're here to talk about today, is, of course, is ISA 100. Uh, the goal of ISA 100, of course, is to create what we call work products. Uh, work products are items deliverables from our committee, and the, the first prescriptive work product, meaning containing information that must be complied with in order to be compliant with, SP, with ISA 100, will be coming out shortly, and it will be called ISA 100.11a. Uh, as the diagram shows, the ISA 100 committee has work products that are both descriptive and prescriptive. Descriptive work products uh, are just uh, uh, how-to manuals or information guides uh, the first one that came out is in draft form. It's available online called Guide to Radio. It's called the Engineer's Guide to Radio, Automation Engineer's Guide to Radio, uh, also called the Physics of Radio, uh, and it's available online. Uh, we're also working on a user's guide, which will have, which will be a descriptive document. Uh, the first prescriptive, as I said, will be the ISA 100.11a document, which will actually describe a real standard as it comes out. And what we're going to talk about today is the uh, Principles of Operation, which is a document that uh, will uh, outline the standard. The standard will be derived from those principles of operation. So the, this, this webcast was, was requested by the users group, and so that's why this was put together uh, as a uh, process for the users group to gain information about how the principles of operation 
uh, might be used to drive a standard. We're going to start talking about boundary conditions, what flexibilities we have and what flexibilities we don't have and why. We'll talk a little bit about history, how we got to the point we are with, uh, with the standard, and what processes we use, how do we get to the resolution, what alternatives are considered, and what alternatives are yet to be considered. And then we'll talk about the critical issues in the principles of operation. We'll talk about what options are included, how commissioning is done, what the light impact, potential impact on life cycle costs might be, and uh, what are the issues associated with interchangeability, timelines, trade-offs, and so on. Then we'll talk a little bit about an end game. How will we know when we're done? How will we know when the principles of operation are complete and we can start working on a standard? And then how will we know when the first standard's done? And I'll talk a little bit about the future, what happens after SP1, after ISA 100.11a. And uh, uh, we'll have a little bit about that. Uh, and as, uh, as Bradley said, if you have any questions, you can type your questions in, in which case I see them immediately, or you can wait until the end and ask them. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to get close enough to the microphone here. I'm uh, hoping that works better. Okay, where are we? We're on the next one. Why won't it advance? Let's try this. There we go. Okay, first segment. For the first uh, 30 minutes or 20 minute segment, we're going to talk about concepts. Uh, in particular, the difference between ISA 100 and, and the .11a standard part of that. We'll talk a little bit about constraints, what drives the inevitable compromises necessary in the standards process. And we'll talk about the particular focus for ISA 100.11a. Uh, we'll talk about what applications and the priorities are for that standard. We'll talk a, about architectures, why architectures are important and why compromises are necessary in order to get to a solution. I'm still learning how to drive this thing. Here we go. So ISA 100, as we said, is a family of standards. And you'll see this family of standards emerge over time. The .11a standard is a focus on, but not limited to, industrial process automation applications. Uh, there is, no, of course, no restriction when the standard issues about how it's used as long as people understand its constraints. Uh, the other document that's already been produced was affectionately known as the Physics of Radio. It's now called the Automation Engineer's Guide to Radio. It was released as a draft in October 2005. Uh, and uh, is available for download. If you uh, want to know how to download it, you can contact uh, somebody on the committee, contact me. I did it. I actually figured out how to do it. Why is an ISA 100 a family of standards? This discussion was held uh, when we first formed this uh, committee. And the uh, summary of why we decided that ISA 100 needed to be a family of standards is because it was quickly determined that one size could not fit all in this standards world in the standard for wireless industrial automation. We also heard a lot from end users about what the difference in, in the markets are. And there are also differences in cultures. Uh, in what's acceptable in one place it may not be acceptable in another, uh, and not for any technical reason, just because it's just not culturally the, way, the right way to do it. But then there are cost sensitivities. One of the things we found in the committee is that some markets are more sensitive to upfront costs, and some markets are more sensitive to life cycle costs. And so we have to take that into account. And then there's the issue of market size. Uh, as we've approached, as we approach some suppliers, potential suppliers for ISA 100, one of the comments they made is that wireless sensors is too small a market. They don't even see it as an interest. And so one of the challenges here is to, is to take into account market size as we look through these available options. So that's, that's how we got where we are. Uh, here are some of the constraints. This, again, is, a, is somewhat to do with market size issue. One way of looking at this, let's see, there is a pointer up here. Uh, does, can you, can, uh, I'm assuming you can see my pointer now here. Yep, there's a dot. Uh, one way to look at this is can we make a separate product for each measurement? You know, have a wireless thermocouple, a wireless pressure transducer, a wireless, wireless humidity device, a wireless current device, a wireless vibration device, and one can do that. 
and one can make each one a separate standard if one chose to. You could have a standard for wireless vibration monitors. You could have a standard for wireless temperature monitors. And then the user would select the appropriate device with the appropriate standard. Uh, that would be a maintenance nightmare. Nobody in the user community would back that one up. The other approach is what I call the classic microprocessor approach. And that is where you say that the application is limited only by your imagination. We can put everything in a single box and say, OK, all you have to do is tell me, do you want me to be a temperature, pressure, humidity, current, vibration, or whatever, limited only by your imagination. The problem then is if you've got one device that does everything, it's complex and it has uh, many modes of failure that can cause all kinds of problems. So when we started down the ISA 100 path, we chose to look somewhere in between these two extremes. We're, we don't advocate a single device that has, that's fully programmable, but we don't advocate a different standard for every particular measurement either. So you'll see the, uh, the way we approach this. Uh, then, then where does a standard fit? Again, here, these are the two extremes, or the two, two ways to look at it. Uh, one approach is you have a dedicated standard that goes inside a product that then goes inside the user application. The problem with this is that it's very limited. It's a very limited standard and a very limited market. And also, it's not sustainable from an end user perspective. Because what happens is if the product becomes obsolete, now you've got to throw away the user application because it's, uh, it, it doesn't have a standard interface. Uh, the other approach that we looked at was if you have a standard that has more breadth and the standard applies to this product, but might also apply to other products within the user enterprise, and then that product applies to a user application, but that product could apply to other user applications. Ultimately, you could apply that product to an entire industrial, industrial segment, and that gives you a nice market size, uh, and we found that to be much more amenable to the, to the suppliers in the, in the market. The problem is that suppliers will struggle if the market niche is too small. And ultimately, the end users lose because the supplier base goes away and you can't sustain production. Uh, I've seen, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Digital Equipment Corporation. It doesn't matter how good their products are, they're not there anymore. What we want to do is come out with standards that fit into a product line that can be made available and can be supportable over a long term for both the user enterprise and an industry segment. We need a win-win that allows the suppliers to supply it and allows the end users to have a sustainable uh, production base. And we think we're moving in that direction. I think Dot 11A is going to be in that way. Uh, the, the focus for Dot 11A, as we said, is, is uh, this is its focus, but not necessarily restricted to chemical, fresh and wastewater, uh, petrochemical, those were the, the, the chemical and petrochemical were the founding members of Dot 11A. Uh, they were the ones who originally called in and said, we want a standard that we can use. We've had uh, interest from freshwater and wastewater people that want to jump in and, and participate. We've had uh, uh, pharmaceutical people who said they want to participate in Dot 11A. Uh, some of the characteristics may not be suitable, but there are people looking at that. And of course, there are others that uh, are not precluded, but other applications have looked at DOT 11A uh, as long as they can live within the performance expectations of the DOT 11A. Uh, the performance expectation expectations I have summarized here, uh, these are based on the current thinking in, in the DOT 11A uh, committee, that the throughput will support sample intervals in the order of seconds. It, the security will be best practice off the shelf incorporating uh, AEC, AES standard, American encryption standard encryption. Uh, it will have a latency of the order of 100 milliseconds. It will have a reliability of what's called three nines. Uh, but uh, you know, if the reliability drops, your throughput, your latency may change. But uh, those are the, the nominal figures that are targeted. We see a range of about 50 meters, but again, you may trade that off with reliability, latency, and throughput, depending on how you configure your network. And we expect the uh, .11a to be able to cover thousands of nodes, up to about 10,000 nodes, over about one square mile footprint. Uh, the thing, one of the things that, that uh, you may not realize is that Bluetooth, for example, in its original form supported a very low number because it was designed for uh, uh, wireless networking of computer peripherals. So four 
or six was a big number for Bluetooth. Uh, and so we had to, when we did, did our dot eleven a and did SP one hundred stuff, it uh, ten thousand was the number that we came that came out of the user's requirements list. Okay. So now we're going to jump into the principles of operation. The, the whole point of the principles of operation is that it's one step away from a standard. It's not the standard, but it provides the details needed to write the standard. If the principles of operation aren't right, then we can't get to a standard. The standard will likely be a subset of the principles of operation. The principles of operation define a boundary uh, within which the standard will be written. And so it will have a, a wider range of options in the principles of operation than will actually be incorporated into the standard. Uh, it's, the details are in there for, de for engineering and operational decisions. Uh, it, it has to be direct, though. It has to have little room for interpretation, but it does have options. But the key is the options are defined and described in very excruciating detail so that if you choose to execute an option, you are not free to implement that option any way you choose. If you choose this option, you have to implement it in the way that's described in the principles of operation. So, so you'll see options in there, but their options are, are defined appropriately. Uh, no freelancing, but it does address options. It has to be thorough. It has to cover the various phases of operation. It has to cover commissioning, configuring, operating, maintaining, expanding, uh, you know, some discussion about decommissioning. Uh, and, but it has to be thorough from that perspective. It has to be a living document, as uh, we discussed on the telecon today. The document will continue to be updated as required to augment and correct the document. At some point, we stop the uh, current document and start writing the standard, in which case uh, updates will come less frequently. But right now, the standard, the, the POO, is under document control, and it is being updated. Uh, it will have in it a path to a standard. The, the document is a superset of possibilities that guide the development of the official release of the standard, and that's what we'll be headed for. Uh, as for an audience, its main audience are the engineers and, and, and the editing staff that have to write the standard. Uh, the end user community, we expect, will need an interpreter, and that's one of the reasons why we have this meeting today, this discussion today because it does have excruciating detail in order to get to a standard. And so we have to work with the end user community to make sure that we have captured the requirements and have a principle of operation that surrounds that requirement. And then as we move forward to the standard, the standard will have the actual thou shalts in it that says, if you don't do this, you are not compliant with ISA 100. That's the bottom line of the standard. The POO is not written in that language. The POO is written in a way that says, if you do this, here's how to do it. The, the standard will say, this is what you must do to be compliant with this standard. And so it's a, it's a next step. Uh, okay, so under this activity, what we've talked about so far is that this .11a is meant to be non-critical, meaning no lives threatened in the application of this standard, and little equipment consequence. Little equipment consequence is up to the beholder, the, is, is in the eye of the beholder. So when a uh, prospective application comes along, somebody has to say, yeah, this is uh, a sufficiently low consequence that I can use a non-critical designed wireless uh, standard for it. It's primarily for monitoring, alerting, and low-level control, again, meaning low consequence if the communication is interrupted. Uh, you don't want a, you know, a, a life-threatening control system based on this standard. It will be low data rate. Uh, low data rate means you sure don't want to run frame rate video over it. You don't want to see reruns of friends coming across your uh, .11a network. You can run vibration sensors, as uh, people have pointed out. A vibration sensor, if you sample it infrequently, if you only send the signature once a day, uh, it would be uh, little impact. And so that would be perfectly acceptable. But a vibration sensor that's dumping a signature you know, every minute could quickly swamp the data rate anticipated for this uh, standard. It will support mobility, meaning that you can have fixed devices, portable devices, or moving devices. But the decision was made that these devices would be move slowly and infrequently. The reason is that's a compromise on the overhead of keeping track of the routing table. 
and we'll talk more about that later, but the, the compromise was that it's primarily for fixed, it will support portable operation, and it does support some slow moving devices. It has to be very low power, uh, low power meaning that in a typical application it will actually last longer than five years, but in any application you would expect it to operate uh, in the order of five years. Uh, we say two to five here, meaning that if somebody starts turning on their vibration sensor, it's going to cut that life down, and we are not going to dictate that in the standard. So it is possible for somebody to, to, to drain this battery quickly, but the design will be for five years or better. The latency will be around 100 milliseconds, which is uh, what we've been told by the end user community is okay for the process business. Uh, the coexistence issues will be addressed. It means that it must coexist and operate acceptably with other standards and other non-standard devices. Uh, in other words, it, it doesn't, you don't want your sensor network to shut down if somebody walks in the room with a cell phone. And so we have to be able to show that we can maintain this uh, sensor network even if somebody's got a cell phone or a walkie-talkie or a uh, laptop that runs uh, 802 Wi-Fi network. It should be interoperable with other ISA 100 devices. Uh, we it clearly ought to be interoperable at, the, at, at some level with the .11a devices. It will be interoperable at some other level with the all ISA 100 devices. So this is a discussion that gets very detailed very quickly is what does interoperable mean? Uh, and we'll talk more about that. Okay, the overview, the, the architecture, uh, Let's see, where is the, have we, where's the break for questions? Okay. The overview of the architecture. This architecture is important uh, because this, this drives a bunch of the compromises that we have to make. Uh, the architectures that are supported under the, the principles of operation are mesh, star, or star mesh, which is sometimes called a tree. And we'll go through a little bit about what the difference is between those, our, those discussions. Uh, also, there will be routing versus non-routing nodes in this architecture. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what that means and what mesh to the edge means. We'll talk about what the role of the gateway is and what redundancy means. Uh, I've I, I got to believe it's time to stop for questions. Uh, Bradley, are you there? Yes, sir. Can we stop now for questions before we get into this? Yes, sir. Or did we have, is there a special place to stop for questions, or do I just decide? Uh, whenever you decide, sir. Okay. Well, let's decide. Let's stop for questions now. Okay. If you would like to ask a question at this time, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Okay, can I uh, answer the one question that's on the uh, typed in message? Yes, sir. There are no questions in queue. Okay, I got a question that says, how will the AES requirement affect use internationally? Uh, the way the, the POS is written is that it will allow the encryption algorithm to be modularly replaced so that if you are going to deploy a .11a standard device in an area where AES encryption is not allowed, you can substitute an, an allowable encryption algorithm. Uh, that's currently the way the POO is written. And I didn't mention that earlier, but it is on something I talk about later. Okay, so we're ready to move on? Bradley, we're ready to move on? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so back up. Okay, here's where we were under architecture. Okay, under under architecture, which number are we on here? There it is. Under architecture, the key things in architecture are the, is the as we mentioned is how you how you lay out the topology, star mesh or mesh star, where you do routing versus non-routing, where you put gateways, and then also how you support redundancy is a key issue for this uh, .11a standard. So that's where we're gonna, what we're going to talk about. This is the classic description of what are the optional topologies. And these are true whether you have a wired or a wireless network. Uh, wired networks and wireless networks have been built with all these topologies. The bus network is the classic for, you know, ISA bus, the ESA bus, and the PC. You know, it's been used in computer architectures for a very long time. 
uh, LSI uh, 11 QBus had this, and many of the other computer architectures had this with the bus architecture. The, and the, the early uh, Ethernet was a bus architecture, the first implementation. The downside is that if any node decides to cause trouble, it can take over the entire process and tie up the bus for a very long time. Uh, the STAR network is uh, one that's used a lot. Uh, some, I build a lot of STAR networks with RS-232, where you have a host and you have all the, the clients, or you have all the, the devices out in the field that talk over the RS-232. So you see a token ring, and a, then you see a ring network. Uh, those have the uh, advantage of a bus. They have the advantage of redundancy, meaning that if any one line is uh, eliminated or has a problem, you still have an alternative path. Uh, token ring, of course, has a uh, time. Uh, every and all, you can only speak if you have the token. The mesh network is fairly new. I worked on some research many years ago on mesh computing, and as you can see, we show five nodes here in a mesh network, and you can see the complexity of the interconnect goes up with the number of nodes squared, and so uh, you find out very quickly that a mesh network can get out of hand very fast if you're not very careful. And so that's what the tree represents. The tree network. It shows is a compromise between a star and a bus, and you'll you'll hear you'll see another architecture that takes advantage of the mesh in there as well. But all these topologies have an impact on reliability because they, uh, for example, the star network has a single point of failure. Uh, they also have an impact on latency. If you send a signal into a mesh network, it's uh, it can become difficult to trace how long it takes for the signal to come out the other side because you don't know how uh, complex the routing algorithm is. And, and mesh can get very complex very fast. They also affect cost, uh, especially in wired networks. The early mesh networks that were experimented with in wired topologies and wired implementations were very costly because of the, the wire necessary and the number of interfaces necessary. They also, these, the, the topology affects throughput a great deal because if you are running a high data rate, uh, you, you, you run a mesh network, and you're running that high data rate through several nodes as it goes in and comes out of the other nodes. Uh, the, the, the current implementation of most of Ethernet is done as a star network uh, for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons was that uh, the throughput was needed uh, to be allocated separately on each of the legs of the star. Uh, security is an issue in these uh, topologies. Uh, for example, in the mesh network, if I'm sending a signal through another node to get to my destination, how much does the node in between need to know about the message? And if it has to decrypt it and re-encrypt it, that's high overhead. So security can have an impact in here as well. And then battery life is impacted, again, because if you're running a mesh network and you're running a message through another node, you're depleting the battery on that node. There's some research going into uh, a mesh network for cell phones. Right now, of course, your cell phone won't work if you can't hit the tower. There is some research, especially under uh, conditions like Hurricane Katrina, where all the cell phones worked just fine. It was the towers that were gone. And if someone could implement a mesh network on a cell phone, it would have uh, allowed people to communicate with each other uh, and bouncing the signal off each other's cell phones to get to, through, the, through the network. The problem, of course, is uh, a lot of problems with that. But there's some research in that area. It does affect battery life. Uh, determinism is an issue here. If you are in a star network, you're going point to point, and you pretty much have the, the determinism uh, down pat. But if you run through a mesh network, your determinism can vary depending on how your signal end up, ends up being routed. Uh, which, by the way, introduces the point that a logical network could, in fact, be different than the physical network. You, the uh, Internet, for example, logically is a mesh network, that you are, in fact, uh, logically connected to anybody else on the net. But in physical reality, these get sent through routers and all kinds of stuff. And so we, sometimes the physical network is not the same as the logical network. Uh, the other issue here is interchangeability. If I run uh, a star network, clearly the end nodes are not the same as the host node in the star, and so they are not exactly the same. Where in a mesh node, in a full mesh, 
all nodes are created equal. In a ring network, all nodes are created equal. So you end up with uh, an issue of interchangeability when you start talking about the network topology. Uh, range can be an issue. Uh, mesh networking is used a lot to increase the overall range of a network. Uh, the idea being I can string these mesh nodes together and have them act as repeaters uh, as they go down the, the chain. And so all these issues are impacted by the topology. And so as the standard matures, as the .11a standard is written, it will have to make these trade-offs. And the, the current thinking is that, that uh, we will run, an, at least one way to run this is mesh to the edge. And one of the reasons is that you want to be able to, to have these mesh nodes that are interchangeable. The challenge is that even with mesh to the edge, you still will not have what's called a full mesh because not all nodes will have routes to all other nodes. They will have routes to some number of other nodes. Uh, and uh, if you go to the fourth bullet, it's called depth of the routing table. And that says how many failures can you tolerate. If you look at the mesh network, if I only keep a depth of two, meaning that I have a primary uh, route and I have a secondary route, now I can manage this complexity. And that's the current thinking in this, in this topology, is that S.11a will support a routing depth of two. Now, that could change. It could go up to three to get better reliability. There are still, still trade-offs being made on complexity versus the reliability. But basically, the depth of that routing table determines how many failures you can tolerate before your network goes down. Uh, routing can get very complex on the third bullet there. That uh, Bluetooth, for example, is the classic story that Peter Fuhr always tells is in a meeting where they had uh, some 30 people with Bluetooth-enabled laptops took four hours and they still didn't get a network formed. All the batteries were dead in the laptops before they got the network formed. And uh, uh, other networks, industrial networks, can take 20 minutes to form a network. So a classic question to ask anybody who's talking about an industrial wireless mesh network is how long does it take for the network to form? And you'll get answers between, from, from a few minutes to, uh, to several hours. Uh, it's a hard question to answer, and it takes good simulators to do it, so, but it's a good question. Uh, and again, the issue about uh, all nodes are created equal is a trade-off. If you want all nodes to be created equal, then you have to trade off battery life and some other issues there. So, so as we go through the pool, you'll see where, we've, uh, where the decision is, is being considered, at least, of which nodes will be con created equal and which ones will be more equal than others. In all these topologies, you have to ask questions like how many? And we, as we said, we want to be able to scale with 10,000. So you, you can see very clearly that you can't get 10,000 nodes in a full mesh network. Uh, they must be a subset mesh. Uh, and also, you can, the, one of the issues here of a mesh network and, and all these topologies, uh, as most of these topologies, is how do they scale linearly? Uh, for the process industries, unless you're, for the process industries, it's uh, linear scaling, meaning long distance in a line, is, is not a big issue. Uh, but we've had people from pipelines call me and want to know, how do I use mesh networking to lay my wireless sensors out along a pipeline? And that gets to be a problem because the, the, the sensors along the pipeline have to relay the message from all the sensors on the other side. And that has an impact on battery life and other things. So what you'll see in the principles of operation for .11a is that there are clusters. These clusters are formed in order to reduce the impact on battery life and latency uh, in, the in the network. So the, the whole point of the .11a is that it offers a compromise. It's a strategic compromise between the optimum uh, characteristics of full mesh and full point-to-point. Uh, -point. Okay, so here are the key points we've talked about so far. ISA 100 will be a family of standards. As we said, it's not a single standard. It's not just .11a. .11a is just the first one. Uh, in Houston, we will lay out our path to what's next and how we're going to get there. If you want to participate in that, you can sign up for that session in Houston. We also talked about the constraints and where the limits come in to impact modularity, flexibility, market integration. We talked about uh, the fact that .11a will be a prescriptive standard. It will actually describe what's required in order to be compliant with the standard. We talked about architectures where the trade-offs are made on constraints, costs, and applications. 
Uh, we also talked about how .11a will support tree, mesh to the edge, and point to point based on how it's initially configured. Okay, so next. Okay, so here's where I had the question and answer period. We already did that, so we're going to skip that. For now. So now we're going to talk about radios. Uh, the uh, segment two, we're going to talk, start talking about the radio, and we're going to get up to some other issues. Oops, I'm still having trouble with this. Okay, okay, so we'll start start with how we do this. 802.15.4 is the radio that has been selected. It's an IEEE standard. We'll talk more about that. We'll talk about how the attributes play together to make up. Uh, the, the, the ISA 100.11a standard with respect to the radio and how it plays off against reliability, security, coexistence, ease of use. We'll talk about the structure of the, of the standard and how we do synchronization and why it's necessary. We'll talk about the benefits of diversity in our network with respect to frequency, time, and space. Uh, and we'll talk about how the, the deployment is actually done for a self-organizing, secure, well-managed and application interfaces. And we'll talk about the FICE interfaces and use classes. We'll talk about the class 1 to 5 with an asterisk. And we'll talk about why we have an asterisk there. So 802.15.4 is a radio defined by an IEEE standard. It's the same radio that uh, is, forms the basis for Zigbee, uh, the, the, uh, the 2.4 gigahertz version of, of Zigbee. Uh, it's been around for a while. It's widely available. There are lots of hardware suppliers. There are lots of software suppliers. Lots of people make different stacks for it. Uh, there are a lot of security options available. It's a very low risk radio. It's very, the technological orphans of other radios have gone away. I, I know one company that uh, asked, uh, for, asked me for advice one time and they decided to go with a company that made its own radio and that company got bought up by a big conglomerate and stopped making their own radio. And so you got to be careful and that's why we chose this radio. Even though it's not perfect, uh, it has some attributes that can be improved on, it was decided that this has substantial advantage over alternatives. Uh, we know its reliability. We, its reliability is not perfect, but it's well characterized. It's been characterized in many environments. Uh, it's well understood. It's been tested in a lot of harsh environments, so we know pretty much how it will behave under lots of conditions. Its coexistence attributes are well understood. The options are available in the, uh, in the MAC layer, as we'll talk about later, to make it uh, more amenable in time, channel, and spatial diversity so that it can better interact with other uh, technologies in the arena. The security offered under, under this radio is state-of-the-art. It's, uh, it's, it's readily available been tested. It's a standard issue part. And the self-organizing attributes are well understood. It offers the options for lower time and lower cost of commissioning. Uh, it, of course, trades off against other things, but we'll talk about that. Uh, this diagram came out of the perform uh, the POO, uh, and it's, uh, it's a description of how uh, the ISA 100.11a radio is expected to interact in particular with the Wi-Fi radio. Uh, the 802.11 radio channels are much wider and can step on or interfere with four channels associated with 802.15.4. And so as you can see on the diagram, channel 1 and channel 6 and channel 11 are shown. Those are the 802.11 channels. And you can see that they can cover a multitude of the channels used under 802.15.4. Uh, the reason for that is 802.11 is a much higher data rate and it needs more power and more uh, bandwidth to carry that data rate. And so we uh, in ISA 100 didn't need that much data rate and that much power and so we chose a standard that had much smaller channels, uh, much narrower in frequency. We can fit four channels into the same space that one channel fits in in the, .11, in the 802.11 standard. Uh, the 802.15.4 standard offers uh, the, these channels available, uh, and that offers the opportunity for better coexistence uh, and more flexibility when you're allocating the channels. Uh, the the uh, uh, availability of frequency agility is important because that way if one channel has a, a problem, either an interferer or a what's called a multipath uh, null, 
then the channel can be changed and that uh, problem can be avoided. And the same thing with time. Uh, in our approach to the MAC layer, the 802 or ISA 100.11a offers the opportunity to move the, the uh, uh, slot around in time, which will reduce the impact of uh, interference from burst noise or from, from other potential interferers. Uh, it also offers the mesh that we need, which reduces the impact of geographically local interference. Uh, you can route around an interferer. Uh, this is very common. There's now a company that sells a product that allows you to map your Wi-Fi network around your microwave oven in your kitchen. It's basically a repeater that allows you to, to avoid the interference caused by your microwave oven in your kitchen. Uh, this is the time synchronization map, and uh, it offers uh, good options available for things like sleep time. It turns out that sleep time is an important driver for battery life. Uh, you'd like to be able to sleep one of these nodes for a long, longer period of time. The problem is while it's asleep, it can't relay messages, so your mesh will, will disintegrate. And so you have to compromise your sleep time with how deep you want your mesh to go. It's also a, a trade-off with uh, time synchronization because if you sleep too long, your clock will drift. And when you wake up, your clock won't be synchronized anymore. And it turns out that that clock synchrony is, is important. And so you, it's important that we synchronize, uh, we have a good, efficient way to define these time slots so that we can uh, adjust sleep times and adjust the data rate. turns out that the higher data rate allows you to transmit data with lower on-air time. So it's a trade-off of how much uh, the faster data rate can actually improve your battery life because you actually take less time on the air. Uh, but it turns out in most of these designs, from a, an electronics perspective, the receiver ends up using more power than the transmitter for a number of reasons. And so you have to be careful how you make these trade-offs with respect to hardware. Uh, with these kind of time slots, you also can improve your security because the codes can, can make any eavesdropper have to listen longer before he sees a repeating pattern. Uh, all, most of the brute force breakers are looking for repeating patterns. They do autocorrelation functions on the, on the bits that they get and try to determine if there's a repeating pattern. And if you have uh, time slots allocated like this, you can make that uh, repeating pattern longer and make it harder to break. Also, it adds defense and depth in, in your uh, security because now you can add security into the, the bit stream uh, as well as into the bytes that you're transmitting. And so the, the tight time synchronization is important for a lot of reasons. Uh, our self, the, the concept of self-organizing redundant networking for the uh, for the performance principles of operation document. Uh, talk about end-to-end -end reliability, allowing the mesh networking to better improve end-to-end -end reliability. You can uh, incorporate redundant paths. You can have dynamically routed paths that are based on errors and timing in your network. You can have uh, self-healing. In other words, if the network starts to deteriorate based on the path viability, it will look for a new path. Uh, it doesn't have to completely fail. You can actually uh, remap based on signal strength. Uh, the the self-organizing mesh network also allows you to do better coexistence. You can adjust your frequency and timing to be a good neighbor. If somebody else is, is coming online and you need to move away to make uh, that person's, that other node's uh, data more accessible, you can do that. Uh, by making time slot, different kinds of time slots available in your timing, you can actually accommodate dedicated devices that have predictable data rates, things like you have a temperature sensor that you, want to, that you would like to sample once a minute. You can predict what that data rate is going to be needed, and you can pre-allocate a time slot for it. Other things like alarms and other bursty traffic, you don't want to dedicate a time slot for it because you're wasting your bandwidth, your throughput. So then you would uh, accommodate that in a shared time slot, which is available. Uh, in the uh, in, in, uh, multiple information models are also supported. I don't know how to turn that phone off. Um, information models are supported that do publish subscribe. Uh, classic publish subscribe is one to many, uh, meaning that I have one transmitter that can uh, relate to multiple receivers. Uh, and then you have the client server information model, which is the most common in the Ethernet and in the World Wide Web where you have a client connected to a server. 
Then you have a bulk transfer information model which says I've got a lot of data and I'm going to allocate a channel and I'm going to dump this data. It may take me you know, three or four days to dump the data, but I'm going to allocate the channel and dump it. Uh, then you have alarms that have high reliability requirements, but they, their data rate may be very low. Uh, and so you have all those information models that can be supported over this network. Then you have the ease of deployment of a mesh network, meaning that I can just plunk it down. If I'm willing to take all defaults and for time, frequency, and security, I can uh, take a node and commission it and have it come up and run much like your cell phone does uh, in, uh, in you know, some cases. Uh, you can uh, uh, have it self-assemble, uh, self-configure. Uh, the defaults will allow it to do that at some level of security. Uh, the, you can do robust and flexible security within this uh, standard, within the principles of operation. Uh, there is a definition for security in the MAC layer that reduces the impact of denial of service attacks. What that does, if you have security in the MAC and transport layer, it keeps the uh, uh, spurious traffic from getting to the application layer. Uh, you, if, uh, if spurious traffic gets to the application layer, it can spoof the application, and that's how you get things where uh, your email starts sending out spurious emails for your, on your behalf. You don't want to do that. So we've, uh, we've dictated that we have security at the lowest level possible in the transport and in the MAC layer so that it stops that spurious traffic as far down as possible. There's always the issue of key management. It, it really drives the effectiveness and performance. Uh, asymmetric keys are the future. The, the, everybody is striving for these asymmetric keys. The .11a standard is, is committed to using asymmetric keys for the very critical functions that we have for allocating, for doing the key management. The keys will be distributed using asymmetric keys, at least that's the current thinking. These keys are harder to break, but they do involve more overhead. They, uh, the advantage of an asymmetric key is that if you know one key, it doesn't give you access to all the data. Uh, they're nonlinear, it's a, it's, a, it's a mathematical function that allows you to distribute a key to someone that can uh, receive your data, but they can't receive anybody else's data, or someone that can transmit data but not receive data. It allows to, you, it requires that you have a, a public, it's also called a public key, because the key doesn't have to be kept secret. That uh, depending on how you do it, you do it in a way that the, the public, the key can be totally public, and it still doesn't matter. Uh, and then the, for higher speed, for, for lower, lower overhead, there's symmetric keys. This is the one most people are familiar with. Symmetric keys uh, is you have a secret key that you give to anybody that you want to, it's like a password. It gives you the ability to decrypt the data. And if somebody has access to that password or that symmetric key, they can decrypt and, and encrypt and pass on data that you want. And asymmetric keys, just because you can read data doesn't mean you can write it. And with symmetric keys, it uses the same key for reading and writing. So it's, uh, it, it, it goes both ways. Uh, it's used for lower criticality functions, but the risk is that the single key can be compromised. Uh, the cryptography that's, that's uh, defined in the uh, .11a uh, POO is modular to allow for export control. I wanted to make the point here, and I, and, and I tried to make the point that, that there are three issues that have the three aspects of security. Confidentiality, meaning that I only want the people who need to get this data to get it. Integrity, meaning that I want to make sure the data gets there the way I intended it to get there. And availability, meaning that I want it to get there in the time frame that I need it to get there. And so the classic abbreviation that's used is CIA, meaning that the priority is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. What this means is that if you're running a bank and you think your security is compromised, you'll pull the plug on the computer to keep people from getting into your money. But if you're running an industrial process, you look at it just the opposite. If your integrity, if you think your security is being compromised, you probably still won't pull the plug because you, it may cause such danger to pull the plug on a, on a control system that you may decide to, to try and ride it out. What you need to know is what is the risk of all these things. They're all risk-based, and that's one of the areas of research is how do you ex assess the real-time risk of compromise of your data. Uh, that's not addressed in the standard. That's, that's research. Right now, the standard is looking at 
the dot eleven a standard is looking at how to balance these three things availability integrity and confidentiality uh, in system management function we have to be able to allocate the resources that we have in particular we're talking about the communications resources nothing in dot eleven a talks about how to allocate the resources of your plant. It doesn't talk about how to allocate temperature sensors. It talks about how, how to allocate the communications part, what dot eleven a addresses. It will do fine tuning with respect to reliability, security, range, throughput, and latency, uh, depending on how you want to do that. It is policy based, which means that if I set a policy, I don't have to set all the details. And again, this is the way the POO is arranged. The POO arranges the, the uh, policies, and then when the standard is written, it will be written around those policies. Uh, it has a reporting function built in that allows the uh, application to access status of the configuration, the current level of performance, what security levels are currently involved, invoked, and how to deal with non-repudiation, meaning if uh, how do I know that somebody is not doing something and how can they how can I assure that they can't deny it later uh, and then there's the support for forensic evaluation uh, these are all balanced against things like you know throughput latency and all the important characteristics so you don't want to fill your disk up with forensic data if you don't need to then there are external issues associated with system management how much remote access are you going to allow in order to support security and the management features. Uh, you know, external allows you flexibility, but it can also open the door for uh, potential problems. Okay, so it's time for another Q&A session here. So we'll stop here and do the application interface next. Uh, I've got some questions on here. Uh, Bradley, do you want to take over and ask for uh, questions on the phone? Yes, sir. At this time, I would like to remind everyone to ask your questions. Press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from Joseph Martinez of Pedigree Technology. Yes, on the back on topic of synchronization, um, I was wondering if um, the, OS, the uh, ISO 100 standard will recommend or suggest um, more expensive, more elaborate real-time clock circuitry to to deal with the problem of uh, time drift. Uh, the current thinking is that it will not. The current thinking is that we can accommodate the level of time synchronous synchronism required with the uh, state of the art that's currently available in the the circuits that are shipped with the uh, 802.15.4 radios. Okay. That's the current thinking. Again, keeping the cost of the end nodes down. The, the way that's going to be done is by keeping relative time in the in the end nodes and keeping absolute time at the higher levels in the architecture. Does that answer your question? Okay. Next question. Again, I would like to remind everyone to ask your question. Press star, the number one on your telephone keypad. Okay, I've got some questions on my question manager that I want to address. Someone said, wow, this is a rapidly anti-mesh talk. Uh, I wanted to reiterate that the issue with mesh is not that mesh is bad. The issue is how do you manage the complexity of the routing? Uh, if you go with a full mesh, you're going to get into trouble very quickly. If you go mesh to the edge with a, uh, a routing of, of uh, controlling the number of mesh uh, channels available, you can, you can converge in less than a second, as someone else said. You can build a mesh that converges in less than a second. The issue is how, how deep is your mesh? Uh, and in and, and .11a, the current thinking is that we, ha we will have a mesh depth of two, which will be able to converge in less than a second. So we don't see that as a problem with, with the, the levels of mesh that we are considering in .11a. Uh, what I wanted to point out is, in theory, there are people who are advocating full mesh architectures, and in the industrial space, a full mesh architecture is just not feasible. Uh, another question came in, is 802.15.4 on the same channels as 802.11bg? And what I showed earlier was how those channels overlap. Let's see if I can get back to that. Uh, too far. There it is. Oop, lost it. 
I lost it again. Where did it go? There it is. That's the channel. The channel overlap is this. Uh, the issue here is if you've got an 802.11 uh, interface and it's running on channel 1, uh, and this is determined by the router. When you go by a router, it will default to one of these channels. And when it comes on the air, it will default to a channel. And so if you put up an 802.15.4 network, it may try to run on channel 11, 12, 13, or 14 and determine whether or not it can. If it can't, it will move up to channel 15, 16, 17. It will avoid, and, and you notice that 15 avoids channel 1 and channel 6. And so there are channels available within the 802.15.4 uh, available network that will avoid the channels in 802.11. And IEEE is working on a standard for coexistence that will uh, require that everybody who plays in this space uh, deal with coexistence in a uniform way. But right now, the plan for .11a is to be smart about how we do the channel allocation to avoid the uh, 802.11 channels. Okay, so let's see. Uh, mesh depth of 2. What a mesh depth of 2 means is that if I have a primary path and it becomes blocked, I will go to a secondary path. If that path becomes blocked before I can establish, reestablish a new secondary path, then I will have a problem in my mesh. If I have a mesh depth of three, that means that I have three available routes that I can take alternatively. I can have route one, route two, route three. So if route one fails, I can go to route two. If route two fails, I can go to route three. What our current thinking is that we will c continue to try to maintain a depth of two so that if one route fails, I'll go to route two and then I'll reestablish a new route two. Uh, how will dot 11a distribute synchronization over redundant paths? Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, I can't answer that. It will have to figure out we'll have to figure out how to do that. Problem deciding which sync source is the right one, yes. The standard will have to do that. Uh, I don't know the details of how that will be done. We recognize that it's a problem. But we think we know how to do it. We just have to decide which one, which way to do it. Uh, 802.15.4 channel 26 is not available. Yeah, channel some of the channels, uh, even though we people say that 802 that the oh, 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 that the 2.4 gigahertz band is available in all uh, parts of the world, it, there are some channels that aren't available. So only some of the channels. So you have to be real careful how you do that. Okay, so we did this. Now we're up to. Well, we did radios. Where are we? Application processes and modes. Radios and systems. Okay, now we're going to go to processes. Is this where we are? No, no, no. We're up here. My bad. Application interface. Yeah, we did this. Now we're up to application interface. Uh, to me, the application interface is, is one of the really critical issues here. Uh, it will be object oriented. It will be based to encapsulate the uh, information for reuse and consistency. It will be attribute based and it will be functionality based. The attributes uh, contain detailed setup and runtime data needed to, uh, to allow the applications to communicate. It will be functionality based because it will allow methods and internal states. It will define supported commands. And so the application interface will allow programmers to start writing application code. And this is one of the areas that's critical to, to future longevity of any standard. It will map legacy protocol, what we call translators, that can be written to translate to or from ISA 100. Similar commands will be remapped from lower layers. This is different than tunneling. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about tunneling, but this uh, application interface is actually an alternative to tunneling. Uh, we'll talk about uh, there, there are issues here associated with uh, data attributes. How do you remap flags and periodicity? Uh, there are issues associated with naming conventions. How do I remap special characters that may or may, may be allowed in one uh, protocol but not another? And there are address ranges. Uh, ISA 100 is going to use a very long, I, I think they're IPv6 compatible uh, addresses, address space. And so if some protocols use less address space, there's going to have to be a translator. Uh, it will be an open, interoperable application environment. Uh, suppliers can start early to build their interfaces to their application software. Most of our high-level suppliers have very vast, very extensive 
uh, applications that run on top of the network to do things like assess the uh, viability of various assets, asset management kind of applications. And they want to get that stuff out there. And so they want to know quickly what the application environment is going to look like. So we're trying to get there. This will be the common integration point for multiple host systems. Uh, DCS, distributed control systems, can enter, enter interface here. And we see this application interface as an alternative to tunneling. Tunneling is a last ditch alternative. And as a number of people have pointed out, it may not work with critical timing associated with some of the hardware interfaces. So we offer, the, the, the standard will offer this application interface as an alternative to tunneling. And graphically, this is the kind of thing it looks like, is down below we have the Phi, the Mac layer comes all the way up into an application layer. And then in that application layer, there will be translators that can translate the commands that are understood uh, in ISA 100 into commands that are understood by the application. Uh, and we see these as the critical value to be added by these organizations. So if somebody's got to own this Modbus translator, somebody's got to own an OPC translator, somebody's got to own a heart translator, and so on. And uh, Fieldbus, Foundation Fieldbus, for example. Someone has to own that translator and make that translation as efficient and, and as optimal as possible. And we see that as the preferred route to interoperability. That's interoperability at the application layer. And, and we will provide support for that to anybody that wants to get involved. Uh, under, under systems, we're going to start talking about devices and their interfaces. Uh, the definition of a device interface is that guarantees interchangeability on a default mode. Options may move out of the total compatibility. In other words, if I have a device and I, I plug it in, or uh, uh, commission it, if I commission this device in its default mode, we are guaranteeing it will have some level of compatibility. It will have some level of interoperability. If the user or somebody says, no, I don't want the default mode, I want some level of enhanced security, then the interchangeability may not be guaranteed. That's currently what's in the, the POO. Uh, we hope that these device interfaces can, are worldwide accessible. The options may be available for specific regions, but the uh, default will be it will cover as much of the uh, global as possible, much global applications. Also defined in the POO are device types and roles. These device types and roles dictate the functionality that's required. Uh, we call the field devices those devices that are exposed to hazards. They have to have the they will have the most primitive communications, just barely enough to survive. These are the I/O devices. They they have the features required for participation in the Phi network in the .11a Phi network. We have defined what are called field routers. They map source data into what the sync expects. What does the receiver expect? So it, it does that under the field conditions. So it has to exist under field conditions. Then the provisioning role is, is a role that has to be accommodated, and that allows new, new devices to join the network. That's the word we use for provisioning. And it, uh, provisioning, and we'll talk more about it. Uh, above field devices, we have what are defined what are called infrastructure devices. Infrastructure devices are somehow protected from the extreme environments. They can be protected through packaging or through uh, special uh, blockers or other ways, but they are somehow protected. And these devices exist in the plant, and they integrate the floor level information into a plant network. Uh, in there, we see gateway role. The gateway role interfaces the field device to the plant network. The backbone router role allows the .11a devices to interface to non.11a devices. Uh, and that's the backbone router's role. Then the system management functions are there to govern policy based on control over the resources. So you have to have a system management function. And then the system management function also enables the security system to operate. The security system is actually a separate function, but it operates through the system management function. Uh, keep in mind that multiple device types and roles can be implemented in a single package. Uh, there was some discussion about does this mean I have to have five different packages? And the answer, of course, is no. I can have a single device that has all these. Uh, today's technology would, might make it difficult, but there are people talking about them. Uh, these are the six 
classes that uh, .11a supports. These are the, the six classes. .11a supports one through five. And the asterisk I mentioned earlier is on the, the, the control, what's called class one. Clearly, .11a can do class two, three, four, five without a problem with the 100 millisecond latency. Uh, the class one, closed loop control regulatory, uh, you notice under description it says often critical. What uh, the dot eleven eight group has determined is that they are uh, not willing to take ownership of the critical loop applications. And, and this was a compromise made early to keep the cost down and get the, the standard out the door. And so if you have a loop closed loop regulatory control that's not critical, in particular some people are talking about using dot eleven A for HVAC controls, for example. Uh, which we see is not a critical application. So there are non-critical closed loop control applications where .11a will be suitable. Uh, okay, so the review again. We had good compromise. 802.15.4 was a good compromise. It seemed like a slam dunk. At the, uh, everybody is picking, uh, picking 802.15.4 as a radio for a lot of reasons for now. Uh, that could change later, and part of our job in the .11a standard is to, is to look down the road at what may be coming later, and in the ISA 100 family. Uh, the, the radio uh, and systems play together in a way that allows us to develop a, a model for reliability, security, coexistence, and ease of use. The structure allows synchronization to improve battery life and security. The level of synchronization that we can get is adequate. Uh, it has diversity benefits. We can use those diversity benefits to improve reliability and security. It has deployment benefits because it has an ease of deployment option with the mesh that allows us to do that. It has device interfaces and use classes that cover all the way from one to five with the asterisk I mentioned. Okay, we did the Q&A. Processes and modes. Uh, there have been a lot of questions about translators, so I wanted to talk a little bit about translators. The joining process has been a question arisen. Uh, quality of service, we'll talk about that, talk about what the security choices are and what the impacts are, and uh, where, where we really need additional user input into this process. This diagram shows how a communication link goes from the application node to the control system. Let's see. Uh, so you've got, you've got a .11a physical device at the lower left-hand side. You've got a .11a physical device. And uh, on the, uh, yeah, so you, you end up with the .11a network feeding the application in the application node. If you've got a fully compliant .11a, if you've got the field router takes the data that's .11a and routes it to the .11a application. As long as you're running .11a, everybody's happy. But if you have a, another control system, and you can, you can run the .11a up through the translator, which is where that pink circle is, that translator translates the protocol uh, into the control uh, application that's in the plant network, and then now you can run it through the plant network uh, and into your plant control application. The translator is an application layer program. It doesn't try to translate the file layer. It doesn't try to translate transport. It only translates application layer. And so it can be very fast depending on how fast your uh, processor is in the node where you run it. Uh, so this is, this is the architecture that we are uh, advocating for .11a. If you don't have uh, a third-party application or a non.11a application, everything runs hunky-dory. This is uh, the model for just the dot, an application to an application. And you can go through the field router, and it will just not have to go back up to the application. And so the data just runs from one end to the other all the way through the .11a structure. Uh, if you have uh, legacy devices, you might add another translator. And this shows how a legacy device might fit in. All the way on the left, you see a legacy application code or node. And it runs a legacy file layer. All the way on the bottom left, you see a legacy file layer. And so that runs into a legacy file in the adapter. The legacy file converts it in through a translator into a .11a uh, application. Again, at the application layer. Then it runs it all the way back down through the .11a protocol, comes back out on the .11a physical layer, and then runs through the .11a network into a gateway, and then could run through another translator into your new control application. So this is a way for legacy, legacy nodes 
to get all the way through to a con new control application. And so this is how we accommodate that. This is all in the principles of operation, as I said. Uh, this is, again, I showed this earlier, I'll show it again. This is what, what I call the canonical .11a architecture. This shows how things fit together. It shows redundancy, it shows the backbone router, shows the gateway, shows the system manager functions, shows the security manager function. Uh, the issue that someone asked about is how do you synchronize the two devices between the two what are labeled GMS devices here. And that's an issue that's yet to be worked out. Uh, but we know how to do redundancy in routing, we know how to do redundancy in uh, the mesh, and so uh, we're moving forward. Uh, uh, the dotted lines here, the solid lines show route 1, and the dashed lines show route 2 through N. Uh, and so you can determine how, how deep you want your mesh to be based on how much you're willing to, to map the routing. Uh, as you can see, this shows, uh, what, uh, I don't know, about 10 routing devices. Uh, and, and so you don't want to get this number up to numbers like 3,000. So you always want to have some way to cluster these. And that's what .11a does. Uh, this is how you join the process. This is part of the provisioning. Uh, the, uh, you start with a clean device. The clean device is an has ap in it application-specific code, for example. It has some defaults assigned. It has security information installed. It's just a clean device. You just open the box. Now you want to introduce it into your network. So you may download new application code. You may download new defaults, depending on how you want to do that. Then you introduce it to the network. Now you're allocating, now you're introducing new, some security and network information. And how you want this node to behave on the network, what address you want it to have. So now you're going to do that. Now you're putting the device on the network. So it's got to join. It's got to, it, if it's a router, it's got to accept routing information. And then finally it will link to the application. And then when it links to the application, it's fully integrated. And so uh, the same thing happens on removal. When it gets removed from the network, you'd like to move up the stack. You'd like the network failure. You'd notice that your, your application is no longer connected to my device. And so you start moving up the stack. And this is how you troubleshoot as well uh, in knowing where your, your uh, device is in this process. Uh, this is an uh, application request versus default quality of service. Uh, quality of service is a function of, of how good is my connection, how much do I get, okay? And so these are the applications on the left side. If you look down the left side, you see periodic, publish, and subscribe buffered. That's the classic default application that we expect in .11a. In other words, I'm going to have a temperature sensor that's going to report its data every one minute, and that's what that is. It's buffered, it's sent out, and everybody gets it. Another function is the client server function where I say, you know, I'm going to connect to that device and I'm going to do something. To it. Then you have queued source and sync where I tie two devices together. I hardwire them together. That one is not, uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, another application. Then there's the bulk transfer where you just stream data if you want to, you know, allocate a channel to stream data. Uh, what you'll see is that the period, the, the quality of service across the top we will say that if you use periodic, you're going to get it. If you unicast, you can get it in any of those functions. Unicast meaning I'm going to send it to one other device. If I want to multicast, I can't do that today in anything except uh, client server is what this says. I can, no, it's, the checkbox isn't there. So there are no checkboxes under multicast. So there is no multicast supported currently under .11a. Uh, reliability function, there is a reliability function built into the standard under bulk transfer. What does that mean? That means if you need a reliable connection, it's got to be handled above this layer for uh, uh, other connections. And the reason is you want to be able to time it out. Uh, bulk transfer is a streaming method, and it's going to keep trying until it gets through. Uh, the, if you want unacknowledged transmission, you can do that in the top three, but you will get acknowledged only in the bulk transfer. Uh, if you want enhanced security, you can get enhanced security in any of these by requesting it. Uh, you can get basic security in any of these. And then you have a priority you can associate with any of these. And so this defines what options are available uh, at, uh, at, to the application in requesting uh, the use of the ISA 100.11a network. Uh, this shows that you have to maintain your security level over the, the network. 
It doesn't do you any good to have a very secure end device if it goes through an unsecured network, and that's what this diagram is meant to show. If I have an incoming security layer, incoming security level of unsecured, which is the top, uh, it's on the left. Let's see if I can. I had this dot working at one time. No, nope. I got to learn how to do this. I guess. If I have an unsecured, yeah, there it is. If I have an unsecured incoming level. I can send it to an unsecured outgoing level, and I can send it to an authenticated, and I can send it to an authenticated and allowed. So all across here, I can do this. But if I have an incoming security level that's authenticated and confidential, I can't send it to any node except one that is authenticated and confidential. I can't send confidential data to an unsecured or unauthenticated sync. So this defines how security is sent across the network. Uh, principles of operation review. Again, we're basing this on the current status. The security and joining and several other issues have details yet to be worked out. Uh, and so this is an ongoing process. As I said, there are options in the .11a standard. These options are yet to be determined and how those options are actually implemented are yet to be determined. And what their full impact and how, their impact, how they will impact interchangeability is yet to be determined. But all these are now bounded. The, period, the POO bounds where we expect the standard to fall. Uh, we have certain flexibility allowed at this stage, but soon that flexibility will zero in on the real standard. The interesting question about the future is, will there be a .11b that's, that follows uh, ISA 100.11a and ISA 100.11c, or will it be some other designation? So the question about where we need user input. This is the area. I've seen a lot of discussion of this. Dick Caro is on this call, and he knows that there's a lot of discussion about options and how do options affect ease of use, and when do we stop and create the new state? When do we just say we're not going to add any more options to .11a? We're going to call it something else. We're going to call it .11b, or we're going to call it ISA 100.12, or we're going to call it something else. We have to be very careful how we define the defaults to make sure they satisfy the sweet spot in the user requirements. These base requirements have to be satisfied within the defaults. Uh, and then we have to define within .11a how we're going to address the future. How do we future-proof .11a? Are we going to future-proof it with .11b? Or are we going to future-proof it with something else? And then the security issue. What is the minimum level of security that's acceptable to the user community? Is it none? There are some people saying they want the default to be none. Other people say, no, we want the default to be some, but we want to be able to turn it off. So one of the options may be no security. Uh, what maximum is acceptable? And how do, will I allow hardware provisioning? If I really want a secure network, do I have to go to a wired link to get it? There's some discussion of that. Uh, one of my favorite topics, what are the metrics? How can I determine my online performance? Uh, right now, there are standards, there are a lot of research in this area, how to determine this without adversely impacting the network. If I send dummy traffic around the network in order to determine the performance, I've corrupted my measurement. Then there are some non-communication properties. How do we deal with the ruggedness requirements? How do we deal with battery changing operations? How do we deal with the, the issues associated with normal instrumentation? Uh, how do we reference those standards associated with them? Okay. Uh, how many participants do we have? We have, I don't know how to read this chart. Okay, we're up to a new question session. Uh, at this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star, delete number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Again, that star, delete number one on your telephone keypad to ask a question. Okay, uh, while we're waiting, uh, one of the questions is, what is a backbone router? So I can go back to that picture here. Where'd it go? Here it is. A backbone router would be a router that sits in the, in the uh, backbone device, BGMS. These would be uh, a backbone GMS. Backbone meaning a high-speed network that is available in the infrastructure. It's not furnished as part of the instrumentation package. It's furnished as part of the uh, infrastructure package. So it's a backbone device that routes our uh, field traffic over a backbone plant network. Uh, it could be part of somebody else's instrumentation package, but it's not part of the .11a package. 
Yeah, no questions, then, to you. Okay, someone, okay, there's another question up here. What standard will cover critical control and safety applications? Uh, that is a question to be asked at the Houston uh, meeting. That's exactly the question we're asking. Uh, we are considering a number of standards uh, for the ISA 100 uh, family to be addressed next. One will be critically secure applications, one will be critically safe applications, uh, and so these are being considered. Uh, if you want, anybody who wants to have a vote in which is considered next should come to the session uh, allocated for that purpose. The date of the Houston meeting is October 1st, 2nd, 3rd, uh, who has a calendar? It's the first week in October. I think we start on Tuesday. Uh, there will be some meetings. There's a user's meeting on Monday. So uh, if you want to come to an all-day or a half-a-day user meeting, it's on Monday of, the, of that week. And then uh, Tuesday, uh, we start the, uh, the sessions. And I think ISA 100 is Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, the opening session for ISA 100 is Tuesday as I recall. Uh, let me open my calendar and check for sure. So uh, no questions, Bradley? No further questions? No, sir. Okay, let me check my calendar. October, uh, the ISA 100, ISA, the ISA conference itself starts on the 2nd. ISA 100 specific meetings start on the 3rd. And they run, they run Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So the ISA 100 specific meetings start uh, uh, Wednesday. Uh, there are uh, cl there are sessions. I will be doing sessions on the floor and within the ISA Expo Conference on the second of t on Tuesday. But the ISA 100 meeting itself starts on Wednesday. Okay, there's another question that's come up. Are higher speed applications like manufacturing being considered? Yes, that's one of the applications being considered for the next standard. And I uh, uh, advocate, I encourage you to come to the meeting on, in Houston uh, to make that decision. We will be voting in, in a official formal vote on which way we want the standard to go next. This, we're assuming that the dot .11a is about to issue and we have to decide how we want to uh, bite off the next standard. And manufacturing tight, the tight controls necessary for a manufacturing environment are being considered for the next one. Uh, we first decide what we want to do and then we'll decide how we're going to do it. Okay, uh, I see no more questions on this one. I see no, are we done here? Let's see. We did this. Then we're up to here, seminar survey. Okay, you're supposed to complete the following four slides, right? You have these. Uh, are you, do you, who does this, uh, Bradley? Do you do this or? Yes, do if, if you're done, I can conclude the conference. Yep, we're ready to conclude the conference. Okay. This concludes today's comp ISA web, web seminar. Please do not forget to fill out the evaluation survey found at the end of your presentation slides. Please fax the completed forms to ISA at 919-549-8288. Thank you for attending and have a nice day.